Good morning and welcome to Art 116. Um, would somebody unmute their mic and let me know if you've heard this before. Um, I wanted to take a moment and talk to you guys about the possibility of doing um, a project next quarter that has to do with the masks and mask design um, for the Invent Oregon thing. Did I do th did I do this spiel on Wednesday? Did I talk to you guys about this on Wednesday? Because I can't remember what I've done from day to day. So please, somebody who was here <clears throat> on Wednesday or saw the video, let me know if we've already talked about Invent Oregon. You guys are no fun. All right. Um, I'm going to assume that we have. Oh, there's Adriel. I got to turn up my thing because it was turned down. What'd you say? I think we did go over that. Last okay. Time. Okay. Fantastic. So I'm not, not to belabor this point, but I just, if anybody is actually interested in fashion design, um, does some sewing, has a sewing machine, um, and wants to get involved in something that could be an extra line on your resume about, um, fashion design, three-dimensional design, then join my team. Let me know. Um, email me or something if you're interested. And I'm moving on to something else. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> what else is there? Um, we took the midterm. Um, we got our uh, triad done. And so I'm looking at a three-day weekend staring me in the face. We will not meet on Monday because it's a President's Day holiday, national holiday. I think the school is closed. Pretty sure the school is closed for classes. So I wanted to get a project up and running so that you guys weren't sitting around with, for six days with nothing to do. So um, let me go ahead and do a little bit of a kind of a presentation um, about the next project, which leads into the next project. Then I'll do a little bit of a demo with the next project and all of that. And having said all that, let's go share my screen, shall we? I'm going to go to screen share, if it'll let me do that. Here we go. Okay. So we're going to turn this on. Okay. And yay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so I was talking to you guys last time we spoke about such things, about triads and how to how to determine triads, how to choose triads off the color wheel. Our next project is to, to do a project about a tetrad, a four color color scheme. And so <clears throat> your authors have this wonderful way of determining a four color color scheme off of the um, color wheel in which it is fairly balanced. And by balanced, I mean, <clears throat> you know, two colors that are maybe in the high key range of color value with two colors that are in the lower key range of color value as um, chosen by superimposing a square over the top of the color wheel. You can also do the double split complement, which is taking a complementary color pair and splitting off to both colors of both of the uh, colors in the cup complementary color pair so that you're using those four colors um, at the uh, corners of the dotted rectangle there. So if the colors in the complementary pair were yellow, green, and red, violet, and you split off to the, you know, split double split complements, you would have yellow, green, red, and violet would be the four colors that you could use in that color scheme. Um, oops. Um, I forgot to tell you guys about analogous colors. It was a it was a question on the quiz. It was in our reading. It's something that I just don't cover because it's such a dumb thing. Um, analogous colors are, are are adjacent to each other on the color wheel. Um, if you guys pitch a fit because everybody got it wrong on the quiz, I might be able to forgive that one. But otherwise, um, <clears throat> this is what analogous colors are, and we're going to move on because. Um, it's such a minor kind of a color scheme. This is what an analogous color scheme might look like. Um, the analogous colors would be um, red, red, violet, um, um, you know, that range of colors, orange, you know, uh, even a, a yellow, orange, an orange, a red, a red, violet. So they're all kind of together 
on the color wheel, giving you um, that kind of a sense unified, but it's only using like one portion, one quadrant or so of the color wheel in an adjacent color scheme. <clears throat> What I want to move into are two things, warm and cool colors, because um, it's, it's a thing to talk about. Um, warm colors, you know, are associated with um, uh, warmth, with things that are warm to us, like um, sunshine, fire, um, those kinds of things that can create a sense of warmth and well-being in human life. And so everything that's a warm color would be in the yellow to orange to red range would be considered a warm color. And of course, the cool colors are those that are associated with grass and ice and water and that kind of stuff that feels cold to the touch that we have this visceral emotional reaction to uh, on the cool side. So anything from of the greens through the blues to violet is considered a cool color. And that's another way that we split up the color wheel into two different kinds of color, warm and cool. <clears throat> and on our color wheel, this split is a diagonal, but it's a fairly vertical diagonal. So everything on the left side of the diagonal is warm and everything on the right side of the diagonal is cool on our color wheel. <clears throat> I want to talk about this simple, stupid still life uh, that Paul Cezanne did fairly early in his career. Paul Cezanne was a post-impressionist, and his still life with apples was done <clears throat> in uh, you know the la latter part of the impressionist period, the early part of the post-impressionist period. Cezanne is known for his choppy. Um, kind of square-ish brush strokes, but he's also known for doing something later in his career um, that isn't necessarily exhibited here real well, um, and that is eliminating white and black from his palette and only using colors to paint with, only, only colors and no use of white or black, or a really, really diminished use of white or black <clears throat> for a thousand years of painting, you know, before the Italian Renaissance and all the way up to the 19th century. Painters relied heavily on the use of white to tint all of their colors and black to shade all of their colors to change the value of the colors and to some extent the um, uh, intensity of the colors so that they would, um, they could. Uh, give you shadows and to, you, they could uh, modulate the colors, uh, neutralizing them somewhat so that the colors would harmonize better in a composition. Um, and so the, the use of white paint was used um, as a highlight um, where a photographic highlight or a light highlight would reflect back to the viewer's eye on a three-dimensional surface like the surface of an apple, spherical apple, three-dimensional. And black was usually used, you know, as part of the shadows um, where either cast shadows were happening or shaded areas of the three-dimensional object were happening, like on the right sides of all of these apples. With this painting, the light source is coming in from the left side, and the light source is illuminating the left side and the left front of each apple. And so you can find kind of where the light source is coming from by looking for the highlight in the front of each apple. And it's just off to the left of center. And that's kind of where the most um, you know, reflective highlight would be coming from, from the um, uh, light source. You can also see where the shadows are going. The shadows, uh, the cast shadows behind the fruit um, goes off to the right from the lower left to the upper right. And so again, the shadows are in a direct line with the light source. So the fruit is in the middle of where the light source is hitting it and where the shadow is proceeding out the back of the object. So all of those things can line up and you can kind of draw a line between the shadow, the object, and its light source you know, out in front of the object. So that's kind of the rationale, the, the, um, the way that this is uh, structured. And it's been done like this for um, 
years. Cezanne, well, by throwing away white and black, and you might argue that some black is being used in this composition. I, I'm not sure whether some black is being used in this composition or not. I see some white in this composition, so we can argue about that. But he had an idea that color itself um, had uh, an, an ability to create volume and uh, three-dimensionality in a composition. The illusion of space um, could be created just by using color. So by using warm, bright colors, they tend to advance towards the viewer's eye. And cool or neutralized colors tend to recede from the viewer's eye, opening up a three-dimensional illusionistic space. And so he started this idea of only using color and trying to not use black and white to some extent to do that. <coughs> because he did that, I chose this, um, this composition for us to work with for our color tetrad. Um, so this is an explanation of warm and cool color that we've already been through. I also wanted to touch on another post-impressionist painter, Georges Seurat. And this is one of his paintings, um, Bathing at Asnier's. Um, it's a beach um, on the Seine River in Paris. And we can kind of see that he was a pointillist painter and he used little tiny dots of color um, in his paintings. And so his paintings would take a long time to do. They might take months to complete a painting because he was only putting little dots of pure color into the painting. Um, and then he would intersperse the dots so that, you know, even in an area, I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but even in an area of blue water, like in front of the knee of this bather, this swimmer who's sitting on the, on the uh, beach, um, this is blue, but it also has a smattering of the orange dots that are found in the hats and the swimming trunks and in the hair of some of these people. There's a smattering of orange. There's a smattering of the white. There's a little smattering of the green from the grass interspersed with this blue. Now, the blue is in there at 70 to 90% density. And these other colors are smattered in there you know, at 10 to 15% density, but they do break up the blue so that the blue isn't solid. And it gives you much more of a sense of a dynamic shimmering kind of depth to this color of blue here. When we go into the swimming trunks of the bather sitting here, we can also see that his swimsuit is not absolutely solid orange either. It is 70 to 85% orange, but there's a smattering of other dots in here because there's other color around here that is kind of um, uh, reflected in and out of this color. And so some green is smattered in here. A teeny tiny little bit of blue is smattered in here, as well as some other neutralizing colors. So you can see that when you really look at Surratt's painting that you're going to find an intermixing of colors within the color dots. And so there's not a solid color any place because the col a color can predominate, like in this area of the grass over here. The grass is at least 50 to 60 percent green, but there are lots of yellows and a little bit of orange and some blue interspersed and smattered in here to break it all up. And that's something that we are going to examine as part of this three for the price of one project that we're about to do. <clears throat> so um, I, I showed you Cezanne because he was the one who came up with the idea of plastic colors, that, pla that colors can be, um, uh, can have the ability to create compositional depth in a composition that in general warm colors and bright colors, we have to say bright too, full spectrum intensity colors tend to advance in the composition. Because you can even have a cool color, but if it is a if it is a strong shape of full spectrum intensity color, it will also fight its way forward in a composition. So in general, warm colors advance and cool colors will recede. Um, but also full spectrum intensity colors will advance while neutralized or gray colors tend to recede in a composition. And so when we look at this painting, once again, in the background here where all of the factories are, 
uh, and the smokestacks and everything on the horizon, all of these colors are very neutralized out. They're all very grayed out, and there is really nothing that's a strong contrasty color in the background, and that tends to plunge the background into depth. While in the foreground, we have brighter colors that tend to advance towards the viewer and pop forward, and they tend to um, you know, create this sense of depth in the composition, plastic colors in a plastic space, by getting more contrast in the foreground, warmer colors in the foreground. Even this dog that you would think is brown, but is predominantly orange, is popping forward towards us. So bright colors, warm colors tend to advance towards the viewer in a two-dimensional painting. And grayed out colors, neutralized colors, tend to recede in a compositional space, thereby opening up the depth of the compositional space and the depth of the shapes too. Okay, so I'm coming back to the Cezanne apples because this is gonna be our little project. We're going to reinterpret this thing as a color tetrad. That is, you're gonna choose four colors from the color wheel that you're gonna use in this composition and you can only use four colors. You may only use four colors. You can't use five or six colors. No cheating on this. So four colors, <clears throat> and we're gonna, we're gonna paint this Cezanne painting in the style of Seurat by using dots instead of paint strokes to paint our painting. Let's see, am I done? I'm done here. So I'm coming back to you guys. So here I am, I'm back so that I can now demonstrate the craziness that I'm talking about. So let me um, change, um, Change cameras here if possible. Yay, okay, we've got our overhead bird's eye camera. And so we're gonna do a couple of things in the workspace here. I'm gonna give you guys um, a copy of Surratt's painting of Still Life with Apples so that you've got something to refer to. So, you know, it's good to be able to print this out as a hard copy in color so that you have something to refer to. And I'm going to ask you guys to use your color wheel and to choose a tetrad. And we choose a tetrad by overlapping a square on the color wheel and choosing the four corners at the four corners of the tetrad. So on this particular one, I've got yellow, orange, red, blue, violet, and green would be the four colors that I would be able to use in this painting. And I would want you guys to write those colors down so that you don't forget and you don't cheat. But you can also rotate this square any way you want to. So you could use orange, yellow, green, blue, and red, violet as the four colors in your tetrad. You just, you have to use a square. Well, you don't have to use a square, but you have to use one of these methods to choose a tetrad. And so I'm gonna rotate this thing again. And so now the four colors would be yellow, red, orange, violet, and blue, green. It creates a color scheme and it forces you to use that color scheme. And these color schemes have a certain kind of balance in them. They've got at least one high key color, one low key color, at least one warm color and one cool color. This happens to have two warm colors and two cool colors. So you're all good there. Um, but as you rotate the square, you know, you get to choose, you know, different um, four colors, but always a couple of warm ones, a couple of cool ones, a couple of darker ones, lower value colors, and a couple of higher key colors. And that way you have a range of color that you could paint with so that when you're applying the paint here, um, you're able to get uh, the range that we want. You've got warm colors that can advance. You've got high key colors that can create, um, uh, highlights on the front of the fruit to make the fronts of the spheres pop forward. And you've got low key colors and you can kind of intersperse your dots equally to create a neutralized area. Um, and that will actually create shadows and darker spaces in the background, which will make the shadows and the unlit spaces between the apples and the spaces on this tabletop recede into the background. So we want this space behind the apples to be neutralized 
and somewhat low key so that it recedes into the background while this area in front of the apples that has a highlight on it because that part of the tabletop is closer to us, that actually advances, it, it advances whoop, towards the viewer. This comes up towards the viewer, this recedes away from the viewer, that actually takes this tabletop and it makes it kind of lay down like this so that you get a, a leading edge of the tabletop that's closer to the viewer and a trailing edge, edge of the tabletop that moves away from the viewer deeper into space. Um, another way that you could um, choose a color tetrad is this double split complement concept. So you have a complementary color pair like yellow and violet, you split off on both ends to the adjacent colors and the colors you'd use in a double split would be yellow, orange and yellow green or red, violet and blue, violet in this particular case. But this can be, um, rotated around the color wheel. So you could use orange and yellow, violet and blue as your double split complement. Or you could use red, orange, yellow, orange, and blue, violet, blue, green as your double split complement. You get to choose which method for determining a color tetrad you're going to use. The standard or orthodox way by just superimposing a square over the color wheel or the super fancy double split complement tetrad uh, by doing a complementary color pair and then doing a double split on both ends to determine your colors. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you guys to paint a painting like this. And I'm gonna provide, I'm gonna provide a template that you can work off of. So I have taken a photograph, scan, whatever, of the uh, Cezanne painting, and I have printed it out. I have Photoshopped it into just um, the outside edges of shapes. And so we have this kind of paint by numbers thing that we can work with. This is the composition. So that <laughs> for those of you who are kind of uh, artistically challenged and couldn't you know, really uh, create a painting of your own from scratch or even copy a painting like this from the original and figure out how to make the, or the uh, oranges, the apples round. This gives you some scaffolding. This gives you some support to go by. So this gives you something to start with and you're gonna paint directly on this. And so what I'm asking you guys to do is to take a paintbrush and Instead of using the brush end of the paintbrush for painting, we're going to use the butt end of the paintbrush for painting. And so um, this is there's four colors here. I've got red, green, yellow, and violet um, were the four colors that I chose for this painting. And I was going to just see what those were again. Red red and orange, red and orange, oh, green and violet. That's a double split complement that goes like this. Actually, it's supposed to be, it's, no, it's red and yellow, red and yellow. Okay, that would be this way. Red, is that this way? No, red, yellow. How did I do that? Red, yellow, I got red, yellow, violet, and green in here. Yellow, red, violet, and green. If it was, Yellow and red orange, that makes a double split complement. That must be what I did. I must have, <laughs> I must have done something like this. Um, is this what I did? Must have been what I did, or this must have been what I was trying to do. Anyway, this is what happens when you don't write down the colors that you choose by actually using this method. You can get off a little bit. And I must have gotten off a little bit when I did this because what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing red, yellow, green, and violet, which is not a true tetrad in either way. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. But you can see what I'm doing here with the yellow. I'm using a dominant area of yellow dots in the foreground to get this puddle of light in the foreground to make the illuminated portion of the tabletop advance towards the viewer so that it actually takes 
the tabletop and tips it like this towards the viewer so that this feels like it's advancing towards you and using a smattering of all the colors in the composition to try to get them to um, neutralize each other out up in the top edge to get the top edge to recede in space and move away from the viewer as a plastic color in a plastic shape. Then with the actual apples, um, you know, given the limitations of what I had to work with here in terms of color, and we all are going to have limitations, so we're going to have problems with this. Cezanne was able to use more than four colors. I will stipulate that. I will grant you that there are more than four colors in this painting. So we are going to try to only use four colors in our painting, but the high key color will tend to be on the just left of center portion of each apple, which is going to wind up being the highlighted portion of the apple, which makes that part of the sphere um, advance towards the viewer. And then using a, a smattering of neutralizing colors, you know, all four colors in the composition on the um, portion of the apple that's a, um, a crescent shape where the, where the shading starts on the side of the apple, there's a crescent shape on every apple on the shaded side. So you're going to have to do kind of a smattering of different colors there to get each apple to feel like that's a shaded side. And then still, when we look at the original, those things are still just a little bit stronger in color than the colors that are in the shadow, shaded shadow portions of the composition. And so we really need to get a neutralizing set of all four colors interspersed and kind of neutralizing each other. And these are all um, full color dots of color that are densely packed in here so that you get a sense of them kind of giving you optical color mixing so that we get this neutralizing effect in the shadows and in the whatever between the um, apples. And then when we get towards the end of this thing, after you guys put in about six or eight hours of painting into this painting, we will, I will give you some other pointers and tricks to make these app, to rescue your apples because they're all gonna kind of uh, fade into mud. So I will help you rescue the apples when it comes to that point. Um, I'm gonna get you started with a little bit of a demonstration here, just because um, you're probably asking yourself, self, what is he? What does he want us to do? How are we supposed to do this? Um, you know what? I better use the uh, I better use the color wheel to pick my four colors. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of a lot of nasty, terrible crying and stuff. So my four colors are going to be yellow, orange, um, red, orange, yellow, orange red, orange, blue, green, blue, green, and blue, violet. I'm going to try to build a painting out of these four colors here. And I've written them down so I don't forget. But now I have to actually mix those colors because I don't have those colors. Um, there we go. Uh, here. So yellow, orange. I think I'm going to just start off with a yellow, orange. So... If you guys are with me, yellow and orange, make yellow, orange, hooray. Okay, so you're gonna need that and you're gonna need your uh, paintbrush, which I just seem to have thrown away. Um, where, did, where did I put my paintbrush? It was just here, there we go. Okay, so taking a little yellow and mixing it in with the orange to make a yellow orange. This is gonna be my highest key color. This is going to be the color that's going to work as an orange or as a yellow. My other color, red orange, is going to be my red color, which I'm going to lean on predominantly to try to convince you that these things are apples and not oranges. So I've mixed the colors together, but I don't really want to use the brush end of the paintbrush for this. What I really want to use is the other end of my paintbrush. And I want to do this kind of thing right here. I want to, and this is the part that might, might drive you crazy that might, um, you know, but it also might fill up an otherwise kind of rainy and boring 
weekend for you. So in the middle of all of these apples and kind of off to the left side of the middle is going to be the part of the apple that um, has the highlight in it. And it might be the best place to start. We'll just try to put a highlight of <clears throat> yellow orange into a couple of these highlight portions of the apple. Whoops. So see, this is, you know, sometimes you're, you can slip a little bit and then you get an orange that kind of creeps in there too. So that might be a way of doing this. Right here, this apple has the stem portion of the apple pointing straight at you. It almost looks like a donut because in the painting, we have the shadow of the stem end of the apple pointing straight at you. That is kind of a little bit of a, um, oh, it's gonna be a challenge to paint this one because um, how does he do it? He kind of, he runs um, a little bit darker color in a crescent shape, kind of in this lower um, right-hand corner a little bit. And then he kind of wraps a couple of different um, highlights on this apple. So there's a little highlight here. He cheats and put a little bit of highlight up here. He even cheats and put another little highlight here where there might be a bump in the apple. So we got like three different bumps that have the highlight on them. And so on something like this, we wanna look for that. And so there might be some highlight up here. And he did a high little highlight over here as he did this, but the predominant area of highlight on this apple is probably gonna be right here. And then of course, we're gonna run from the highlighted portion on the crown of the apple. Then we have to run into the shaded portion of the apple where the stem part of the apple goes down into the apple. So each one of these has kind of like a stem or blossom end on the apple. And sometimes it's in the upper hemisphere, sometimes it's right up at the top and you don't even see it. But otherwise you have to deal with that idea that there's gonna be a little shadow dimple on each apple. But that also helps to define, that's one of the characteristics of an apple. And so we have to deal with how the light and the color um, are applied to the painting and how we're gonna deal with that as painters reinterpreting this painting. So, you know, this is gonna take a while. Each application of paint is gonna take an hour or two, and you're not gonna just fill this thing up once with a set of dots. You're gonna to try to, um, you know, do the best you can to get these dots jammed as close together as possible. But I'm gonna uh, change to my other painting here. In the fullness of time though, you're gonna get like maybe two sets of dots overlapping each other. And you're gonna to get to a point where you're even gonna to try to be um, using some of the dots to um, uh, break up other dots. And so they're gonna be overlapping each other and, and mixing together and that kind of thing. And so that's gonna be an interesting kind of concept of how how do we play with optical color mixing in a composition to get the apples to do their thing? I may have just screwed up this thing because suddenly this apple doesn't look as round and three-dimensional as it used to. I might have to play with that a little bit and see how I can make that better. I've got my um, the shaded portion of the apple, the, the stem end of the apple is right there. And so I might have to play a little bit with this new color that I have introduced here. Now I'm cheating because I've got a fifth color going in here, but I'm <clears throat> trying to get um, the sense of the roundness of the apple by kind of reinforcing this outside edge and um, uh, contour line of the apple. And then I've got to try to get this portion of the apple that, um, kind of works as the highlight of the apple and just see how that works right like that. So anyway, um, this is gonna be something that's gonna be trial and error and you're gonna play with shapes and how um, we create shapes and lines by just connecting dots in a composition. This is gonna be a really interesting long-term project. This is a project that'll take at least 10 days to complete. This is going to be a high value project. I haven't decided if it's 30 or 40 points, but it's going to be a lot of points for this project. 
and it will be suitable for framing. When you get done with this, even though it's kind of a copy of an old master's painting, you know, we call this an homage. You're paying homage to Cezanne and the idea that he created of um, plastic color, which is a really important uh, 20th century concept, the idea of plastic color. And, you know, you can then, um, you know, hang this on your wall and it, this is your interpretation and also your understanding of plastic color from a Cezanne painting. And we're just going to see, you know, how this kind of works in a composition and how, you know, you can um, explore the concept of pointillism painting, optical color mixing, um, plastic color, and using a color tetrad as your color scheme. I guess this is actually a four for the price of one project. And so I'm gonna come back to you guys so that you can see my happy face. So coming back to the talking head view here. So we're gonna to try to paint something like this <clears throat> over the next week to 10 days. So, I made hard copies of this thing on cardstock. I've got 40 or so copies of it outside the west door of Eden Hall on the tabletop with a rock on top. Please come over and get one or two. I know that you're probably going to think you're going to screw one up. And so you're going to need at least two copies so that you can um, you know, have a backup in case you mess one up. But I have to tell you that in painting, you can't mess this stuff up. You just keep painting over the painting. You keep painting over the place that you think is messed up. And when you come back over the top of it with wet paint over the dried paint, you fix things. Painting is the easiest thing to do because you can't erase. All you can do is continually build with color, continually advance the painting. And if something is wrong, you just wait until it is dry and then you paint over it again. And so you don't need to erase because you can always just change it with the addition of more paint. This paint has a certain thickness to it. I don't know if you can actually see that these are dots of color that are sitting on the surface of this thing, but there's a three dimensionality to this and an actual texture to this paint that's going down on this. So yes, there might be 10,000 dots on this painting. But this will be a painting that you have painted in a design class, a painting that will be suitable for framing. This is the size of a painting that will fit in a $10 frame available from Walmart across the street. And so by the end of this class, you will have you know, a piece of artwork that's suitable for framing that you can give to somebody for you know, their birthday or some other holiday or something like that. And it's, it's a nice painting. It's a painting that could go in the living room or kitchen or whatever. It's a really nice painting. So you're gonna make, you're gonna paint a nice painting whether you like it or not. You have to paint it though with the back end of the brush, not the, not the brush end of the brush. You can use that for mixing the colors if you're having to mix colors, but you actually have to paint the painting with the tail end of the brush, with the hard end of the brush making dots that size. So that's the game. The game is afoot. I have, told you of the game and given you all the rules and that's the game. This recording will be available for you to review if you want to see the demonstrations again, if you want to see the um, PowerPoint slides again, please come back and visit this in the YouTube recordings section of um, <clears throat> our e-learning shell. Do you guys have any questions for me before I wrap this up today? Um, this is a four for the price of one project. So it's all going to be built on creating a color tetrad, a four color scheme that you have to select off the color wheel and write down those colors. And then you're going to base it off of this. I guess I'm going to have to um, print out 
30 copies of this and also put them out on the table so that you've got one of these to pick up because I don't know if you guys all have color printers or not. So I'm probably going to have to print out these on paper so that you can pick up one of these and one of these off of the table outside so that you've got this to go by. You need this as a visual reference to see the highlights and lowlights and colors in the composition. And this is going to be what you're going to work on to work out your interpretation of Cezanne's still life with apples. Okay. Thank you so much for your attention today. Look what we've gotten ourselves into. I'd really like you to get a start on this by getting these materials together today so that you can paint on this over the weekend and on Monday, which is a national holiday so that we won't have school on Monday. The next day that we are gonna have class is Wednesday. And by Wednesday, I'd like to see this thing started. Doesn't have to be finished, but it does need to have a significant start to it by next Wednesday. So um, I guess I'm gonna say goodbye for now. I don't see any mics unmuting, so I don't see any questions or comments happening over there so if you have a question email me um, or come on over and pick up the uh, handouts that are going to be on the table at the west entrance to eden hall let's see i didn't hear any, i thought i heard something but it wasn't something i'm going to go print out 30 of these so that i've got a stack of these to put out there too these are already out there on the stack so give me half an hour to to make these and then I will have two stacks uh, for you to pick up. Pick up one of these and pick up one or two of these to get you set for the weekend for painting. And we are going to paint ourselves a still life. Until next Wednesday, have a really good weekend and a really good holiday on President's Day on Monday. And I will see you again next week on Wednesday. So goodbye for now.